Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Tom Beard. Uh, my wife, Marna, and I have Luna Valley Farm. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. How about that? Okay. My wife, Marna, and I have Luna Valley Farm near Decorah, Iowa. Um, Here's a picture of us and our son Fritz. Marin likes to say that she's the pizza farmer and I'm the I'm the farmer. We're both full time on our small farm. A little bit about our farm, just just for some background. <clears throat> um, by pizza farmer, uh, we have we have some agritours and stuff going on on our farm. We host pizza nights on Friday and some Saturday nights during the summer. We have a commercial kitchen in our old barn and um, a pizza oven outside under a lean. We also have some canvas wall tents in our in our Baroque Savannah that we host um, overnight guests through an Airbnb. Um, so that's 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 a that's a lot of work. That's a full time job for for one of us for Marin. Um, we also do some more traditional farming on our farm. Lots of lots of hay. Um, we also do some organic cash crops. And our our farm is in uh, extreme northeast Iowa. It's part of the Paleozoic Plateau, also known as the Driftless Region. So it's uh a pretty pretty rough landscape <clears throat> so i think our our landscape is well suited for livestock production especially specifically ruminant livestock production we can keep our our land in perennial forage that way so we we do grass finished lamb and grass finished beef we also have a few few hogs but the, they're not not on pasture So yeah, there's our some pictures of our livestock. Um, so, so there's a question: Why would you want to fence difficult terrain? Because it's difficult, right? This, um, I guess the the main reason is that we don't all have access to to less difficult terrain. It's it's more expensive. It's less available. Um, so I think fencing. Difficult terrain allows us to utilize less valuable land with livestock and maybe land that's that's suitable for grazing with livestock. So that land is cheaper, it's easier to access, and it also um, allows us to utilize parts of our farm that aren't suitable for cropping and for crop farmers. Um, and there, I think the land can benefit from grazing. I, um, there's the opportunity to control woody brush, such as multi-floor rows. We have lots of lots of kind of nasty brushy stuff that grows up in our woodlands sometimes. Multi-floor rows, prickly ash, honeysuckle, buckthorn. We have all those on our farm. <laughs> I think the the livestock can also benefit from from be, having access to this dif difficult terrain. It adds some diversity to their diet, and it's also good cover for them. A shade in the summer and also cover in the winter. So when you're talking about um, difficult terrain and forage and livestock, it sounds kind of like the definition of silvopasture, which the most basic definition I found of silvopasture is a combination of trees, forage, and livestock. Our, this session is not about silvopasture, but I thought it was worth worth mentioning. Um, it's kind of a if you're a, a grazer, it, it's kind of a exciting thing to think about and to practice. I think I've I've um, been studying up on a few books about silvopasture recently that might be worth checking out if you're interested. Um, silvopasture by Steve Gabriel and uh, the Grazer's Guide to Trees by Austin Unruh. Here's a, a chart that I took a photo of out of Silvopasture by Steve Gabriel. I think it's worth taking note of this this first this first column here. The whole whole chart is 
is good. But so it's appropriate land use types for silva pasture. Um, but what I, I noticed about this chart is that some of the most appropriate land uh, types for silver pasture are, have probably the, the most difficult terrain. So the land that can most benefit from and um, that our livestock can most benefit from might be the most difficult to fence. And it's I, on our farm, we have some um, kind of a mixed landscape, some Baroque savanna that's pretty overgrown. It, has been overgrown and also lots of fence rows and stuff so I yeah I definitely get excited about um, grazing those areas carefully and giving the livestock access to them sometimes but there's also areas on a farm where I've I don't often give the livestock access they're maybe less appropriate for grazing maybe higher quality timber All right, let's get into into some of the difficult terrain we're we're dealing with. Um, in the dripless region, we have lots of natural features, lots of uneven terrain. So our our hills and valleys often have waterways, and in, in the bottom of the valleys, there's lots of trees and brush in the valley sides. We're also um, predators are are um, a consideration when you're deciding what fence to use on your terrain. And some other other considerations for not um, other challenges, maybe not natural ones, but um, lots of our farms probably had livestock on them in the past, and maybe haven't more recently. So there's lots of lots of fences that have been in place that have kind of fallen in disrepair and worn out over time. So that's um, something we see a lot of. There's also planted trees and crops that we want to keep our livestock out of and protect those valuable trees. On our farm, we have lots of visitors and we also um, rent some pasture from neighbors. So we want um, want our fences to be safe and um, and to look okay on the landscape. Uh, one thing. I've been dealing with recently that makes fencing more challenging is frozen ground. I tr try to avoid fencing too much in the winter, but it's, um, it's something else to think about when you're when you're deciding what kind of fence you're going to use. Um, there's a picture of our our border collie Noche uh, checking out some difficult terrain. <clears throat> and. Uh, our son Fritz likes to go on when we're when I'm fencing. I if it's uh, I try and avoid the more difficult terrain when I when I have him with me. If you see him this weekend, you'll see he has a nice nice scratch on his nose, and that is uh, not something that happened while he was fencing with me. Let's look at some strategies that I've uh, of kind of learned over time. Um, I guess you kind of probably a lot of people would use a combination of portable and permanent fence for their livestock. There's a lot of I use mostly portable fence and I think there's a lot of benefits to using portable fence. Um, Electronet for sheep is I found it to be quite secure. It keeps the sheep in, keeps the predators out. In my experience, it's less costly. I think I also like it for its appearance. It's because it's portable. You only have it up when you need it, so it keeps the landscape looking a little cleaner. It also allows you to remove brush when it's when it's not up, the brush can't grow up in the fence line, and you can also um, control weedy species easier when the fence is not there. It's 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 really it's endlessly flexible. Um, and I, you know, we have both sheep and cattle, so I I do I don't graze them together, so I do match fence to 
the species I don't use Electronet for the cow because it's it's not necessary. Uh, uh, the downside of permanent or temporary fence, at least one downside is that it's it takes a lot of time to move it. So permanent fence definitely has its place. Uh, we use some of it on our farm, uh, probably mostly as a perimeter fence. We're still still working on that. We don't have a continuous perimeter fence. <clears throat> so positives about uh, permanent fence is that it's secure and that there's less labor after you have it up. Uh, downsides, I guess, would be another one would be a appearance. If your farm is all sub subdivided by permanent fence, it's kind of breaks up the landscape. But uh, it's a spot for if you're trying to control brushy stuff, it's a spot for for that stuff to grow up. Um, it's another obstacle on your, f and um, and it's also costly to install and time consuming. And when you're, if you have multiple species of livestock on your farm, you have to, you know, uh, if you have a permanent fence, I think it's important to build it to contain the hardest animal to contain. So you're over fencing for some things. So which brings me to my one of my strategies is to use the minimum amount of fence possible for that specific livestock species when you're when you're fencing difficult terrain. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm, so I think as far as ruminant species, they they may be the easiest to keep in. We um, we use a lot of a lot of single strand poly wire for the for the dairy cattle, and it was electrified sometimes, not not all the time. Beef cattle maybe are a little little harder to keep in. Sheep a little harder, and uh, and then uh, goats. I <laughs> I don't know about goats. They're I think they're kind of uh, a real challenge in my lim very very limited experience. Um, so we all know that electric fence is not a physical barrier. The livestock need to be trained to respect it. Um, and in that, we need to, um, if there's specific animals that are have bad, really bad habits, they, uh, it's important to not keep those around. I, for an example, I had, most of the time our sheep are pretty well behaved. I had a one ewe lamb this summer that got really good at even, you know, if the fence was set perfectly, um, it learned to get its nose down and knock right under the fence all the time. Uh, it didn't turn out to be a problem because it was, got so good at that, it didn't knock the fence down ever. It'd go in and out, it was just fine. But that was definitely an animal that I chose not to keep as a replacement ewe. So that animal did not stay with the flock. <clears throat> So specifically for, well, one more thing. Um, it's also important to keep your fence in good repair. It's it's hard to keep um, animals in if your fence um, does not carry a charge well. You know, electric net wears out over time, especially if you're fencing in difficult terrain. Um, so what I've kind of a uh, strategy I have with that is every every year after I sell lambs I I order several new rolls of electronet I think I I've kind of settled on four rolls a year if I replace four rolls a year I can rotate some some junk fence out of out of my fence supply and yeah so specifically for sheep just as an um, I use electronet it's the 35 inch tall single sp spike. Um, I guess I'm kind of set in my ways. I have never uh, really used the double spike, but I, to me, it's just extra weight, extra, extra something to get tangled up when you're dealing. I mean, that's, yeah, I am happy with the security and ease of use with the, the 935-12 single spike. For cattle, I often use a single poly wire with pigtail posts. Um, one specific thing about the pigtail, I mean, those are my favorite posts. I uh, have found that 
they a lot of them look the same, but there there is a difference in quality. If you look for the ones, uh, the high tensile pigtail posts, they'll last a lot longer. They don't bend as, as easily. We have, we use some semi permanent fence for our cattle. It's a single high tensile with wood posts on the corners. Our perimeter fence that we use for to keep both sheep and cattle in is uh, woven wire 42 or 48 inches tall. Um, another way to deal with difficult terrain is to remove it. Um, of course, there's here that's a, a limiting or you're limited to what kind you can what, what things you can do that to but I think probably a strategy for a lot of people is to have alleyways in diff difficult terrain where you can put up and take down your fence, clear out the brush. Um, that's something I yeah have done and still do. And one of my favorite things to do in the early spring is to remove old fences. They really um, they don't provide much value. They're just a hazard, really. They don't look good in their livestock can be harmed by them. So, and I have found if you're, I'm sure not everybody would enjoy picking up old fence. It's not a, um, but I have found that early spring is a really good time to do that after the ground is thawed out and before vegetation grows up, you can, you can see what's there and, um, it's easier to get it out. I have a, I have a, what I call our farm recycling area. It's basically a pile of junk wire and old fence posts, but it's a little bit unsightly, but it's a spot where I can collect that stuff till I'm ready to I'll haul the scrap away. And he here are some kind of common sense fence placement things that I, um, have learned over time. And I think probably other people do some of these same thing. I'm sure lots of other people do these same things. Um, so if I have a, I guess I have a picture of this. So if I have a fence, that's not going to keep my, my sheep in, that's a perimeter fence. It's, it's actually not a bad fence. It's like a four or five barbed wire fence, but it's not going to keep my sheep in. So you can see I, I um, put my fence, my electric fence up on the outside, outside of this barbed wire fence. So it's actually on the neighbors. It's a good thing to ask your neighbor before you do something like that. But it allows the sheep to graze up to the permanent fence. It's just a easier way of dealing with that fence, I think. Um, And a lot of our a lot of our fields are surrounded by trees, um, and I think instinctively, as a as a farmer, I like to you know, well, our, I mean, there's a tendency of box elder trees and brush to kind of push out from the woods. So I like to you know, mow kind of as close to the edge of the field as I can. And there's, I've I've noticed myself doing that with fences too over time. But what I've learned is that um, right along the edge of the field is probably the worst spot to put up a fence. Right along the edge of the edge of the woods, there's that's that's where the trees and the brush are the thickest. So if I keep my fence well away from the woods or like 20 feet into the woods, that's actually, a, in my experience, a much better spot to put a fence. You're dealing with it's just easier. Um, you know, I, I try and keep my uh, Electronet in good repair, but uh, I am a little strategic about where I use my, my best fence. If I'm going to fence in a really difficult spot, I find a mostly worn out roll of Electronet and uh, put it there just so I'm not um, accelerating the wear on my, on my better, less worn fence. And that's also, uh, you could, if you have a especially difficult spot to fence, um, it's I've uh, done this before that I put up a partially worn out roll of electronet and left it there 
for part of the summer till the, till the livestock came back to that spot again, just so I don't have to put it up and take it down one, one more time. <clears throat> um, and when you're dealing with a lot of up and down terrain, valleys, changes of slope, I think it, I like to keep some extra posts on hand, especially when I'm doing single wire, uh, poly wire, you need to um, have the fence follow the train so the animals aren't able to step over or under the fence. With my electronet, I like to, um, I, I do a lot of odd shape paddocks, usually for a daily move, but I like to have the corner square. It's, it's a good spot for the fences to meet. So those conductors on the ends of the fence hook together. And it's also makes it easier for the next paddock if those corners are square to add on to them for the, for the next day. And one thing, um, especially with electronet, you're, you're, it's a lot of material. The fence is quite bulky, so it's a lot of material to haul around and it's, it's not light. But one thing I have learned, if I'm carrying two rolls of electronet, often I'll, I'll pick them up and take them down two rolls at a time. I'll just leave the two rolls tied together. So rather than carrying two smaller rolls, it's one, one bigger roll, which it, it works sometimes. So I think um, probably lots of us have experienced this. So if we're, when we're grazing a specific piece of land, we it's it it gets easier over time. You'll have your alleyways cleared out. The op woods will open up some. Um, so that's yeah, it's uh, kind of gratifying actually. There's a picture of a. I'm not sure where it came from, but a, a peony that's, it's a rented pasture, but it's just grown out in the pasture. It's, so that's nice to see every spring. And that's, that's about all I have. I don't know if there's a couple specific questions, we might have time for that. Otherwise I'll turn it over to Margaret. All right. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, Johnny's asking if I've thought about using two strands of poly wire, and I have thought about that, but we don't, I guess I didn't mention this, but we don't have any guard animals with our sheep, so the, the electronet also serves as predator control, so that's, we kind of just stick with that, so I haven't, yeah, I'm, uh, Uh, well, I'm definitely not an expert on permanent fencing, but the question, um, the question was um, having bends in permanent fence. And the, it is definitely unavoidable in some landscapes, but the, yeah, yeah, definitely the downside of that is that it's more expensive. More bends in a permanent fence equals more posts and more bracing to keep the fence where, where you want it. So that's, that's, if you can avoid it, I guess that's probably preferable. We'll take a question back here and then. Okay. Do you have any trouble with energizers on your uh, uh, Premier One fence? Uh, do I have any trouble with energizers? Yeah. yeah I, world I do sometimes. I guess I kind of, I have a few spares, so I've yeah, I use some 12 volt farm store ones and I've found that the, the life expectancy is pretty short. They're repairable, but um, I've gotten into some more expensive 12 volt energizers that seem to hold up a little longer. But uh, that's... There's a three day uh, charging thing on them uh, chargers. If you don't charge them for three days, the sun doesn't come out for three days. It's like you broke them. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, um, 
Right, I don't use solar ones, just the 12 volt ones. I, I have used a solar one in the past and it it doesn't seem to keep up. And it's just extra, extra things to move around. So I just rotate out batteries. That's, that's what I, we have some solar panels on our farm. So I guess um, they're charging batteries, but not with the fence. So I think I think we'll I'll turn it over to Margaret and there'll be time for more questions at the end. I'm a lot shorter. Okay, is that projecting okay? All right. <clears throat> I have I have a timer going, so I'm trying to make time in for questions. So my name is Margaret Thomas, and I am my resident crazy goat person in my corner of uh, my county in Missouri, actually multiple counties in Missouri. Um, and I'm standing here with a couple different hats on. So I am the, I was a PFI staffer about eight years ago. I'm now here again in a slightly modified role, uh, serving as the livestock viability manager. Um, so that's the top logo there. The middle logo is my own farm logo, Storm Dancer Farm. So I'm primarily a crazy goat farmer, but I've got a handful of sheep, a couple cows, and I've done pigs, chickens, turkeys, and I have one peacock. Um, and then I also, and, and part of the reason I was asked to do this presentation is I've been a targeted goat grazer uh, with goats on the go for the last few years. And so the bottom is the goats on the go, sheep on the go, and farm dog, which is kind of the family of logos for that, um, that organization. Um, so this is simultaneously promotion of doing anything with, with goats and goat grazing. Um, but I also have multiple different contact info. So get a hold of me however you wish to. Ha always happy to talk goat stuff because us little crazy goat people, like we hide and find our other people and then we go crazy talking about it. So I've been doing this targeted goat grazing thing. Um, it's it's targeted grazing specific grazing for a reason we are usually we are getting rid of or targeting certain types of vegetation so if you work with nrcs um, ever for an equip project they will call this biological control of usually invasive species so think your bush honeysuckles um you know your cerecia lespediza casually though we we just call it goat rental that's that's the easy version i tell people when they say what exactly is it that you do and so for this, we are employing a lot of mob grazing principles, right? So we've got a lot of goats on a relatively small area, moving them fairly frequently. Um, so that's it's high, high, relatively high stock density. My average is about 40 mature goats, um, sometimes more on about a half an acre at a time, moving every three to five days, depending on the vegetation. So that is a, a relatively large number of animals in a relatively small area. And so fencing is critical especially since by nature we're doing this usually on challenging terrain so all those like fence lines that that tom was talking about that he try you know he tries to fence away from the brush around the the old fence lines or hedgerows that's what people want me to be fencing off and cleaning out so challenging terrain is the name of the game the the stuff i work on is usually steep brushy rocky you know they can't get equipment up it it's not safe to send humans up there so that's why they want the goats to come do it on the flip side, it might also be highly erodible ground that they don't want to damage with equipment or footsteps or whatever. We also do a lot of stuff around water. So fencing in around through water becomes one of the challenges we deal with. Um, and so portability and flexibility is the name of the game. We use Electronet for pretty much everything because it is both, you know, the, the easiest way to keep goats in and the best way to keep other things out. And I do use a lot of solar, or I'm pretty much entirely solar charger based. So this is an, an example of one of the larger projects I did. This is Luss Hills Prairie, former Luss Hills Prairie. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, kind of Eastern Iowa, North, North, or Western Iowa, Eastern Nebraska, you know, Northwestern Missouri, go up and down I-29. That's that we were right off the road. We could see I-29 from the top of the hill. 200 goats doing about 10 acres over a while, but that is steep stuff that hasn't been maintained mechanically or otherwise for years and years and years. I did not want to have to run a fence up and down that, but I had to a couple of times. So again, strategically fencing around the rough terrain. 
Uh, this is more Lus Hills Prairie, slightly better managed in that same general corridor. Um, this was a Department of Conservation project, so they they'd burned a couple of times, so we've got these old skeletons of trees. They'd gotten their Ficon machines up part of the hill a few times to just rip stuff up, but they couldn't keep up with the sumac, they couldn't keep up with the, the things growing where it was a lot steeper, and this is highly erodible ground, so goats were their perfect solution. That's as far up the hill as I could get my gator and my water, so I had to do all the rest of this on foot. Challenging terrain is the name of the game, and so I've tried to be a little bit smart about it. Like Tom, I use the 93512 um, netting from Premier One. If you've never used this stuff before, and especially if you're thinking about fencing goats in with it, this is shorter than a goat can jump. Talk about why the goats stay in something that's shorter than they can easily jump. Another thing to keep in mind about this, and Tom mentioned this with his one wayward uh, lamb, that bottom line is not charged. And so I have had goats who learn that and use it to their advantage and my frustration. Um, I just called mine straight away because my doe who did that taught her kids to do that, who taught their buddies to do that. And I was like, nope, this entire family is leaving. Gone. Bye. So the primary principles I actually operate when I am trying to do fencing on difficult terrain, before I even pick up that roll of Electronet or grab that solar charger, it is a bit of a mindset game, all right? Um, I want to have goats that are trained to that fence, and I've culled, as we mentioned, I've culled the animals to get to that, so I don't have to fence as hard, so that if the terrain is just that tough, if there's a, a, a low spot in the fence, if there's you know, slight fault in my construction, hopefully the goats are trained enough to stay where I want them just because I've selected them the right way. And manage grazing so that there's less temptation for those goats to go on the other side of the fence. So if you keep them where there is food and their buddies are there, usually you have a decent time. Learn to think like a goat, which is a little bit of a dangerous thing because if you how many, how, how many are goat people? How many are not goat people? Okay, yes. So learning to think like a goat is, is a bit dangerous because they are so wily. They have that cleverness and they use it for evil. <sighs> so what I tell people with this is try and understand their motivators. They want food, they want their buddies. The things they are afraid of, they're afraid of being isolated from their buddies and they're afraid of that electric fence shop. So their behaviors, if you're doing this right, okay, they're herd animals, they want to stay together and they want to stay where there is food. So if you provide them a good barrier that has that fear of the electric shock and their buddies are on the inside and the food is on the inside, they're generally not going to, to run off. Generally, goats have a penchant for mischief. They, I appreciate my sheep because they're so simple. Not as fun as the goats. I have a little bit of a problem, I think, because I think the goats are the fun ones. But just keep that in mind. You can set it up perfectly and you'll always have some screwballs. So basically you're trying to understand the goats risk benefit analysis. There is something tasty on the other side of that fence, but my buddies aren't on the other side of that fence. So if you collect the right group of goats who's happier to stay with their buddies, happier to stay where you put them because it's simpler, you're going to have a bit of a better time. But just keep in mind, no matter what you do at the end of the day, goats are jerks and they will make you look like a fool now and again. So with that in mind, when we're setting up fence and strategizing about a project like those Lus Hills Prairies, try and prevent situations where the goats can easily see over the fence. Now again, you know that 35 inches is usually like right around eye level. They're, they know the top of the fence is there, but they're usually not putting their heads over it. So if you can keep it that way, you'll do a little bit better. Try not to create situations where they can see under the fence and notice that gap. Try to not to create situations where something else can fall on or tangle in the fence. And try not to create situations where the goats have no option but to touch that fence. So with the goat mindset in mind and with these general principles in mind, here's kind of the best management practices I've come up with. That top strand of that electronet has to be as high and tight as it possibly can be. That bottom strand needs to be as low and as flat to the ground as possible. Reduce contact or proximity to obstacles, branches, rocks, whatever. And avoid, avoid lanes, alleys, tight spaces, unless you are actually trying to move those goats. So these are the main sorts of challenging terrain I deal with. Obviously, just general uneven ground, the hills, the slopes, um, natural obstacles, and then dealing with water. So I'll go through all those quickly. 
so uneven ground, just, just general undulations in the ground um, is, is relatively easy to deal with. When you're setting those posts apart of that, of that electro net, you're pulling it nice and tight so that the top strand is tight, the bottom strand's flat on the ground, and as needed, use some of these extra little temporary posts to keep, you know, to keep the top strand up and the bottom strand down. These little guys with that little, that little hook there, that's the best because you can hook that over that dead bottom strand, pin it to the ground. I like these guys because you've got the different heights available here and that just, and these are a little bit lighter weight. I can carry more of these than these. So that's, that's my one preference for those, but they don't, they don't come with that little hook on the bottom. So this uh, old stream bed we were fencing, and so here's a typical uneven ground. We're sloping down on that side, we're sloping down on that side, and we just gotta cover this kind of, deal with this low spot in the middle. Um, so this happened to be a spot where two fences overlapped a little bit, and so I had one running low to the ground, and this other one stretched a bit higher. So the goats couldn't stand on this bank and look over the top line of the lower fence. They had another one that was a bit higher. Hills and slopes, since now we're talking about big, big, big hills and slopes, when you're fencing either across, like kind of latitudinally, like across the side of the slope or going up and down. So my main principle is to avoid situations where the goat is above the fence and is looking over it, basically. Keep, keep their head, keep their eyes generally below that top line of the fence. So you don't want them to be able to look over it and think about jumping or where they can fall and get tangled in it. Um, so again, think of this all from the goat's point of view, and again, consider the goat's mindset if, if you dare. Ridge tops are an easy one. So not only was this the clearest, easiest place to put the fence, but by having the fence along the top of the ridge, when the goats approached it from either side, they couldn't see up over it. So there was very low risk of them deciding, oh, I can just hop over that. Uh, at the same time, I had to really watch the bottom of the fence here because they were gonna be approaching, approaching that and they might have seen any gaps and thought about going under. So fencing across the slope, or particularly at this, in this instance, in the bottom of a hill, uh, this is actually an old rock quarry. Um, fairly steep slope down to here, but here was the, the road they would drive the trucks or carts or whatever up to, to the rock quarry. I fenced on the opposite side of the road from the goats because I don't want them standing up on this slope and looking over the top of a fence that was right against the bottom. Temptation to hop over the fence. Better instance of this, so this was a tiny little side yard in town that I did. Um, so this is where the dirt ended, so this is where I had to put my fence. Now the goats could stand right here, and I mean they were the head and shoulders above that line of fence. This made me a little bit nervous. We ended up having no, no issues with it, but let's think about it again. What is the goat motivated by? Food, there is lots of food there, and the goat's motivated by companionship. All its buddies are here. At the same time, the goat looks over that fence and there is no food on the other side. So I was, I was betting on the idea that the goats were gonna say, you know what, I don't see anything particularly tempting. I'm just gonna stay here. Also cars. Um, it worked out, but this is also a case where I didn't push the goats. We ate 85 to 90 percent of that available green stuff instead of like 90 to 95 because I did not want to take that risk of them saying, eh, you know what, the, the bushes across the way look a bit better. Fencing down a slope. So this is when you're like going from top to bottom or vice versa. So this is a property I'd done a couple of times. This, this slope is cover, it's super duper steep, but it's like covered in kind of riprap. They rocked it uh, as a way to try and mitigate erosion. Um, and they weren't necessarily, you know, they wanted to clean up all these vines just because they were, it was not the ideal type of vegetation they wanted. So they brought, we brought goats in to help clean it up a little bit. Um, so again, across the top of the slope, this is great. You know, the, the goats aren't going to go over that fence because they're, again, they're approaching it from the downhill, from the downhill side. Not tempted to go under it because there's nothing tasty on the other side but I had to subdivide going down this hill. So right now I'm looking across the top of this driveway and then this next picture, I would basically turn 90 degrees towards the hill, towards the slope. So this is me fencing a hill the wrong way because I didn't know as much at the time. So from where we're standing, looking basically straight down the hill, the fence does not go straight. This was a problem because the fence curved kind of to our left. The goats were grazing 
at the time on the left side of that dividing line. So a goat, there would be cases where the goat is standing up on top of the hill, the fence goes down next to it and then curves in front of the goat. The goat is now standing uphill of that fence, can see on the other side and says, oh, I can jump that. I can jump that. I can see the other, I can see that there's, it's not such a bad jump down there and they were tempted to hop over. That's happened. We also had a freak rainstorm. The goats got startled and one of them actually slipped on those rocks tumbled down the hill, caught in the fence, strangled itself, died. So if the fence was going straight down the hill, we would not have had that problem, or it would have at least have been less likely. So I try, now that I know a little bit better, I try to either go straight down those hills, or I would curve away from the goats, or I would have started the goats grazing this side first. If the fence curves away from them, there's no place where they can stand on the uphill side and see over. So here it's doing a little bit better. Luckily, I figured it out by the time I did a project this big. You can see when the goats are up on the top of that hill or even as they walk down, the fence line curves away from them. So at no point can they stand here and look over the fence downhill. They're always looking uphill relative to where they're standing. Hard to explain. I'm hoping that makes sense. Can I get a thumbs up? Or, okay, good. So this is a better way to do it. Now you look at this and you say, well, what happens when the goats move here? Now, now they can look over the fence again because you had it curve, because it curved away in paddock one, now that they're in paddock two, I don't want to take down that fence and flip the angle. Once they're in paddock two, there's nothing tempting them in that old paddock. They've already cleaned it up. So once again, I'm betting on that food companionship risk analysis and betting that now that there's nothing tempting on the other side, they're not going to want to jump it anyway. So again, multiple layers. I've got my goats trained. They know the fence, they respect the fence. They know I'm going to move them before they get really hungry. And then I'm playing into what I know of their motivating factors. So if you're fencing across and down a slope, this is another one of those Lust Hills Prairie sites. The farmer did not want me to graze the, the kind of bald tops of the hills because he actually had some of the desired forage in there. He wanted me to mostly focus on the downhill stuff. So the goats did not graze this. They did graze all this tree stuff. And then there were more trees over here. This is just where the, the fences worked out. So this was a little bit of, you know, again, goat psychology and goat strategy. When the goats were grazing all these trees on the downside of this hill, that was super secure. They couldn't there was no temptation and it was hard for them to think about hopping uphill. Um, so as long as I kept that bottom line flush to the ground, that was a pretty secure fence. Once I had to move them here, obviously, then they could be standing uphill of all that brush on the bottom side. But since I grazed that first, there was nothing left for them to graze. It was less tempting. So again, think about it strategically, play, play into that goat psychology. Physical obstacles, branches, rocks, things like that. Um, so there are tons of these by nature of the fact that someone says it is too dangerous, annoying um, to get equipment or people into this area. Please bring the goats in and let them do the hard work. Um, so there's always natural obstacles we're dealing with. One thing, always look up. Um, I'm trying to keep almost like a six foot eyeball diameter around every fence I'm setting up to look for potential obstacles. So avoid things that can fall on or tangle in the fence. I have relatively few escapes. I've been culling and training my goats for enough years now and I've got some seasoned pros in my crew. Um, I don't usually have escapes because the goats decided to escape. I usually have escapes because something else fell on the fence, knocked the fence over, you know, picked the fence up, tore through the fence. Um, it's, it's other things that can happen. And I try and minimize that by looking at the, the things in the way, but I don't always win on that one. So I do a lot of cutting, breaking limbs, things like that, just to min minimize the shorts in that fence, uh, keeps it running nice and hot, but then reduces the opportunity for things to tangle in or crush the fence. Um, look up also because again, goats are goats are natural gymnasts and acrobats. Um, so I had to I had to fence like way around this one because if you fence right underneath it, that goat's going to climb up and then hop over the fence. Uh, guess how I learned that the first time? I didn't think about looking ten feet up. I had to look at like five feet up. No, it turns out sometimes you have to look about ten feet up. Uh, this particular site, this this was a fall and crush hazard. That's a fall and crush hazard because 
The reason we use goats for this targeted grazing is because they stand on their hind legs. They reach up six feet. They grab branches with their legs and pull it down. Like that's the reason we use goats, but then they might pull something onto your fence. Um, so that was not the best place for me to have put that fence. Again, this was the second job I ever did. So live and learn. This site sucked. Um, okay, this is, this is a retirement HOA community. These people had nothing to do but sit there and criticize how I was building my fence to, to, to graze this brush. Um, they hired me because the last time they'd hired a contractor to come kind of clean the, that honeysuckle out, um, they tore up the grass too much and the residents were doing. So anyway, what they wanted me to do was beat the brush back by only about six feet. I said, I am not building a six foot laneway across a thousand linear feet of your tree line. I'm like, no, we got to do a bit bigger than that. So my top fence is here at the top of the hill. My bottom fence is only back there. This is a relatively steep slope with loose soils and bush honeysuckle. Um, the goats would, the goats would put their feet on the on these honeysuckle trees and just literally rip it out of the ground and knock the fence over. So this one was bad all around. What I should have done is gone all the way to the far end of this narrow band of trees and just fenced the whole thing in. Um, other, another thing I learned, so you, look, you have to look for things that will fall onto the fence. You also have to look for things that either touch the fence or go through the fence. So if, if you put the fence too close to, to the encroaching brush you're trying to fence in, if the leaves are touching the fence, the goats aren't going to eat those leaves. They're not going to put their nose that close to the, the thing that will shock them. And I don't want them to, so first off, I shouldn't even create the temptation. Um, second off, what I found will happen is if the goats, you know, drag a branch down and it catches in the fence, they let go of that branch, it springs back up, and now that's pulled the fence out of the ground. So I like to leave, for a couple of reasons, I like to leave, you know, a couple feet between the leading edge of the brush and my fence. Uh, this was fencing off that rock quarry. So when you deal with totally impenetrable ground, um, so not necessarily frozen, but I mean, it's rock, it's asphalt, it's something like that. Uh, you start to get creative. You're using a lot of brace posts. Um, I've found I've gotten pretty good at like identifying cracks in the concrete. I can jam a little fence post, but fortunately, this is a bad visual. My husband also made me um, bases, like you know, a couple of two by sixes screwed together and drilled a hole down the middle so you can pop the little fence post in there and move these around. So these are those are some of my favorite little things. Uh, thick brush. So I've got. Do, do, do. Okay, just a couple more minutes. So, I'll... super thick brush. When you can go around it, why bother cutting through it if you can just go around it? There are cases when I'm on a job and technically I'm only supposed to be grazing, you know, this this acre. Um, but I look at it and I say, you know what? I'm I'm just rolling the fence right around that big thing of honeysuckle because it's easier than trying to bushwhack through it. Easier, more secure. Um, and if you explain that to the landowner, they're usually just fine with it. Um, I did not do that. This was like my second job ever. I did not do that. I was thinking, nope, we're going to do high animal impact. We're going to put crunch a bunch of goats onto a smaller area, subdivide more often. You know, it'll help us go faster. No, I spent so much time trying to get that fence through this stinking uh, buck brush. Um, it was it was miserable. Should have just fenced off the whole thing and let the goats take a bit longer. Sometimes though, you, you are just gonna have to go through it. So popular tools of the trade, weed eater with a blade. Um, there's a little hand, I, I still don't have one. There's like little handheld like pruning chainsaws or whatever, they're like battery operated. They look like the coolest little things. Um, and I really, really want one, but that would be just a nice way to go cut through. Some people will mow, some people will like take a brush cutter and actually cut lanes. Um, Maybe I'm just lucky and my goats have been decently trained enough. I've never found that worth it. I've never found that having that clear alleyway right around the fence has been worth the time and effort to install it. It's also going to depend on your site, though. If it's a really high-risk site or one where you cannot afford to mess up, then, then you do it. Um, this one was just a mess. Creek bed down here. There's this tree over the, over the creek there. Um, I couldn't I couldn't go around this one because there was a homeless camp right there so I had to go through the creek under this this uh, fallen branch and so I had to like drag panels to cover that up so again when you're evaluating the situation keep thinking about all the possible ways the goats could mess with you and and work around that um, 
blaze through water really quick. So if you're if you're fencing up to a pond, goats and sheep generally do not swim. Generally enough that you can rely on a body of water as as a fence as long as it's big enough. But if you only stop your fence right at the edge of the water, if that water level fluctuates at all, um, then then they'll walk around the edges. So I either run a dead section of fence a couple feet into the pond or run some of my fence, charged or not, along the edge or, or along the shore for another, you know, five to ten feet. That way the goats can't ever just see around the corner and see to freedom. They've got a it's not worth the risk. You know, when again you're looking at that risk, that discomfort, that that risk analysis they're doing, not worth it to keep walking and hopefully find a way out. They just turn away. So this is where I've done both. So this is a dead section of fence, or at the end, it's a dead section of fence that runs into the pond and across the pond, the fence comes down here and then runs along the shoreline so that goats over here aren't tempted to walk all the way through that. Across streams, that's another challenging one because if the stream level rises, the water hits the fence, it shorts it out. If the stream level rises, it's carrying flotsam and stuff and, and branches that get tangled in the fence. Um, so you have to, but if you leave too much of a gap between the water and the bottom of the fence, the goats go under it. So streams, usually there's not a perfect way to do it, um, but you do have to check them more often. And if you ever get a rainfall, you better be out there pretty quick. Also, brace posts on either side because you have you usually have a lot of changing elevation right around streams. Um, this is on that same property. This is a, you know, that stream's a little bit wider. This is an effective fence. I don't have to fence on, the goats are here, they're not gonna cross over to there. This is enough of a water barrier to keep the goats in. So my rule of thumb is it's like, gotta be like ankle deep five or six feet of unbroken water. So if there's rocks that they can like tiptoe across, they will. Um, but if it's if it's a solid body of water that's not quite able for them to jump easily, usually the the friends and the food on the near side of the fence are enough to keep them on the, on the near side of that stream. That one was a trip, I'm gonna stick that. So this all said, no matter what you do, no matter how much you plan, the goats are gonna surprise you, but if you, if you are brave enough to start thinking like a goat and keep in a few basic principles and consider their risk analysis, you can be relatively ascent, er, relatively successful. At the end of the day, though, the goats are jerks. They will always make you look like a fool, but hopefully a bit less after this. We've got a couple minutes left for, no, we don't really have a couple minutes left for questions, but I, I know I'm just going to be upstairs at the, at the PFI booth, so happy to discuss anything there.